Uh, General Thompson, thank you. Uh, and please pass on our regards to General Swan and General Sullivan for uh, setting all this up. Uh, General Mann, thanks for your remarks um, on spot. And I'm anxious to see the uh, Waypoint One uh, get out in hard copy. Oh, can I have one? Um, our panel is uh, on an en enabling defeat, a line of effort on, out of the current strategy. And uh, as the panel members, we'll all address it. We're going to do it a little bit different. Uh, well, John will give an opener, and then I'm going to pose a question to the joint community, to the uh, Army staff, to the combatant commander, and then to the war fighters down at the, at the end. So, General Rossi. Thanks, sir. Okay, could we uh, run the video? Let's see if technology works. Mission Command guys ate it up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Mission Command guys. We're on bandwidth. Here we go. smashed to bits by the Patriot. The Patriot is the best defense against Iraq's arsenal of ballistic missiles. It proved it can do the job when it intercepted a scud fired towards Dharan, Saudi Arabia, early yesterday morning. I think Patriot is probably the, the is definitely the king of air defense artillery right now, not only for the United States, but probably in all the free world. We deployed from Fort Bliss in August. Uh, we took the Army's entire inventory of Pac-2 missiles with us, and that was a total of three. None of my officers, none of my non-commissioned officers, and none of the soldiers in the brigade had ever fired a missile against a tactical ballistic missile before. Uh, we talk a lot about the outstanding capabilities of the Patriot system, and it's a great system. But it wasn't just the system, it was the soldiers. The soldiers are what made it work. History was made on 18 January 1991 as Alpha Battery 2nd Battalion 7th Air Defense Artillery intercepted an Iraqi Scud with a Patriot Pac-2 missile. This unprecedented accomplishment set the stage for further product upgrades. The Pac-3 guidance-enhanced missile realized a more reliable hit-to-kill capability. On 7 March 2003, during the opening phase of Operation Iraqi Freedom, two TBMs were launched at Seaflick headquarters, which was conducting a battle update assessment at Camp Doha. Echo Battery, 2nd Battalion, 43rd Air Defense Artillery launched two Pac-3 missiles and successfully destroyed both incoming TBMs, setting a new standard for TBM intercept capability. The Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, commonly known as THAAD, is designed to engage and destroy short to medium range ballistic missiles using kinetic energy. The first THAAD deployment was ordered on 3 April 2013. Alpha Battery 4th Air Defense Artillery deployed to Guam as a precautionary move to strengthen our regional defense posture against North Korea's ballistic missile threat. The Avenger system, with shoot-on-the-move capability, provides mobile, short-range air defense protection for ground units. In the wake of September 11th, Operation Noble Eagle proved that short-range air defense assets, including Avenger and Sentinel radar, could contribute an all-new level of interoperability with existing air and missile defense architecture. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, U.S. forces quickly found themselves in an asymmetrical war with the rise of insurgency tactics. Constantly under attack, our operational forces were exposed to indirect fire from weapons such as 107mm rockets and mortars. 
As counterinsurgent measures were introduced to our forces, so was the need for the latest counter, rocket, artillery, and mortar weapon system, the CRAM. This new system was an immediate success when on 15 March 2006, mortars were lobbed and were met with the magnitude of the CRAM weapon system of Charlie Battery, 5th Battalion, 5th Air Defense Artillery, destroying all incoming projectiles. With the initial employment of CRAM, it provided localized warning, allowing troops time to take protective cover. Currently, our Army National Guard air defenders perform critically important missions. These missions include air defense protection of the National Capital Region, deployable air defense support to the Commander-in-Chief, and the execution of the ground-based mid-course defense in Alaska and California as part of NORTHCOM's Homeland Defense Mission. In the years following Desert Storm, air defense artillery has been on the move in system development, training, transformation, and deployment rotations that surpass those of much larger branches. In great demand, ADA has become the Air and Missile Defense Global Response Force, the high demand for AMD capabilities by our combatant commanders who face growing and evolving air threats in their regions remain constant with no sign of diminishing. Air Defense Artillery is the Department of Defense most in-demand asset around the globe. ADA is comprised of four Army Air and Missile Defense Commands, consisting of eight brigades and 24 battalions. The future holds even more demand on the force, with threats that have innovative and lethal weapon systems. With a stoic history and a bright future, the Air Defense Artillery is prepared to meet this demand. Air Defense Artillery. Trained. Deployed. In demand. celebrated uh, Desert Storm, but also the first engagement of a TBM was 25 years ago. This uh, uh, print up behind me was Alpha 27. It was uh, done by an NCO. Talk about the talent of our troops. That was done by an NCO, the Air Defender, that uh, is retired now and an artist, uh, his image of Alpha 27 in, uh, in Dahran. So just think about 25 years ago, a long time. Uh, we're focused now on the next 25, out to 2040. So Desert Storm is 25 years back. Think of us uh, from our Desert Storm days, 25 years prior to that, it was in 1965, okay? Pre-Tet, uh, we were using dusters and Old Hawk. So do you think that, that the crowd back then on the dusters and the Hawk systems were, were imagining engaging a missile with a missile at that point, or are they just looking at making the next version of the duster a little bit better and upgrading IHawk to something else? Uh, so what you see there is the highlight of change and from Desert Storm and TBMs, and actually it changed the character of war, not the nature of war, but it changed the character of war and what we had to deal with. And it highlighted the strategic importance of missile defense at the time uh, and what it brought. And with that in mind, with that change, the Army responded. And we evolved over 25 years. Evolution occurred. And what we did was we did things like make Patriot better. We fixed problems and we kept pace. Next slide. Okay, that's an old picture. <laughs> okay, really old, and it's blurry because it came off of a video taken by one of those old VHSs you used to carry on your shoulder. Remember those? Um, 1995 in Kaiserslautern, Germany. General Sullivan on the left and Major Rossi walking with him at a Patriot Battalion in Cape Town that he came to visit. And, and I'm highlighting this a couple of things. You can see the commander behind me, battalion commander, is telling one of the ball whose head is down, he's in shock, something. I don't remember what I said. I think General Sullivan asked the question like, hey, who do you think we should recognize? Are there any heroes that, uh, that you want me to recognize? And I think I told him, yes, Bucky Dent and Bill Buckner. And uh, <laughs> so do you see my the, the boss's head go down in the back? And, and, uh, but, I, but I show you this for a reason. That was 1995, February 6th, 20 years ago almost to the day. And he visited the Patriot unit that was really the Patriot unit of Desert Storm, same type, same type stuff. Five years later, I saw General Sullivan, uh, I was a battalion commander at AUSA in El Paso, and I had to on display the Config 3 Patriot system, uh, and he came to see that, a Patriot system that now could discriminate where the warhead was uh, and where the junk was that, that fell upon us on Desert Storm, Then, in some cases we shot the wrong things, and we learned that later. Five or six years later, I saw General Sullivan again, now a brigade commander in Korea on Suwon Air Base, now with a PAC-3 system, fully capable PAC-3 system. So the message was every time I saw him, the Patriot system was getting better and better to keep pace, uh, and that was important. 
uh, and over time we improved our capabilities. So it was evolution. We went to the next level and made it, uh, made it, made it better. Next slide. But one of the things I would tell you is, as we made Patriot better and we focused on it, in essence, the air defense community migrated to what became a point defense uh, branch, a point defense missile defense branch. We took the A out of air and missile defense in many ways, and the A went away because we didn't think we really needed to focus on it. Uh, and we focused on missile defense, guard to protect this air base, protect this port, those kind of things. So when we took the A out, we did it in a couple of ways. We took it out in how we trained. We took it out in how we improved our weapon systems, and we took it out of our structure. We took all short-range air defense out of the architecture with a focus on missile defense. And that was what we needed at the time, a not question decision. That's just where we were. No more divisional air defense. Uh, and that, that's caught up with us, and we'll talk about that. Also, besides evolving, we adapted. You saw CRAM up there. That was an adaptation. You adapt to war to survive, and we needed it. We needed MRAPs. We needed things like that. We needed CRAM. Uh, we built it fast. It works. It was 10 years ago when we had our first CRAM engagement uh, now. And the neat thing about CRAM, which, again, I'll highlight, is it was cross-branch, FAA radars, ADA, aviation, all put into one, put together quickly. Uh, it was cross-service. It was Army and Navy manned, and it was cross-compo. Active and guard, work it, and still work it today. There's goodness in that, and keep that in mind. Evolved, adapted. And we innovated. The TBM three missiles that Colonel Garrett talked about, we only had three in the quiver. Uh, they didn't just think of them a week before and build them for us. 20 years earlier, someone started thinking about killing a missile with a missile that far out. And ultimately, it came to fruition and it happened to be timely uh, when we needed it in 1991. So decades before is when the thought occurred. Again, goodness there. So evolutionary improvement, adaptation for the fight, and future innovation is what we saw. Next, next slide. So where are we now with the threat? So TBMs, obvious. We saw the pictures of them, and General Mann <coughs> talked about them, sort of obvious. But really, helicopters, a threat? Artillery, uh, artillery rounds? Small UASs, UASs, threats? What's the blank box that I circled? That's the bad guy behind their green door working to defeat our network and our capability, the same way we have guys behind doors working to, feed, to defeat enemy, the unknown. OK? Um, but that's the reality. That's what's, what's in place now. It's not a step backwards. That's what here that is what we're dealing with, and we'll move out into the future with. So I'll give you three points to consider as we move forward to defeat these threats. First thing is, don't build to do the last war better next time. You've got to build to the future. We're not doing it over again. We've got to look to the future and build for that. Came up a couple of times earlier. There, we have no choice but to make Patriot better and continue to do that. I showed you 95 to 05. And just talked about that. We have no choice in, to move it forward and continue it while we even while we look for alternatives, or we're going to lose pace and fall behind. And it's not cheap. You saw where the portfolio is at. Half of it's in Patriot, uh, and we have to continue to make Patriot better. And the third thing is we got to find the game changer. Uh, has to be done because it's more cost. We have to change the scenario or change the equation so it's more costly to attack than it is to defend. Okay. And so you see the threat is the driver behind things here, but money is included in this as well. This is not cheap, so we've got to find a game changer. Next slide. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the Army operating concept, that we're not independent operators in the air missile defense community. We're tied to it. And in the Army operating concept, it already highlights that we are already at or can expect overmatch in electronic warfare, long-range fires, and UASs, as well as threat air defense systems uh, that we're already dealing with and have to consider. And I emphasize the definition of fires in this, in my world. And, and what I'm going to highlight is the lethal or non-lethal effects. Um, and I'm going to emphasize that. Lethal or non-lethal effects. So that just, keep, just picture in your head the difference between destroying and defeating, the difference between an explosion in the air and complete destruction uh, as compared to just um, confusing the threat or blinding the threat. Whatever's needed to defeat it, uh, we have to keep that in mind. So uh, a lot of times the focus is on the kinetic, but I'll highlight that we need to look just as hard as the non-lethal effects uh, in, this, uh, in this domain. Um, so think the cost equation that we talked about, more to defend than to attack. And really, if we're doing this right, I've got, I got a history of air defenders up here and, and, and teammates and tied in the air defense community. But if we're looking at this the right way, the next time we do this, I should have General Fogarty sit next, okay? Because I need, he's the partner in this, the non-lethal guy and, and uh, Scotty Barrier and, and Mike Lundy that's going to help win the fight in this domain, okay? 
Uh, we would not put the burden of defeating tanks only on the commandant of the armor uh, school. Hey, there's a tank out there, that's your job to defeat it. Nope, we include aviation in that, we include artillery in that, and we focus on it. Okay, so we have to do the same thing here and looking at how can we defeat a threat, not necessarily destroy it, and everyone in the game, uh, that includes beyond the air defenders, to deal with the threat set in that domain uh, as we look at it. So, again, this is, the, this is an Army problem. Actually, it's a gym problem. And it's not the ADA Commandant, Chris Spielman, and Tim Sheriff's problem to solve this one on our own. We've got to work this one as a team and make sure we have the right uh, folks included. Um, so last slide, I'll tell you what we're working, uh, again, in the Army operating concept, the fire's functional concept for moving forward. Um, and can we find the game changer here? Three emerging concepts uh, that we're looking at, and this is out into the future. Um, first thing is uh, multifunctional convergence. And what I mean here, and some of us already discussed it, is merging select branch attributes, uh, weapons, organizations, et cetera, to move in into the future. This can't be just ADA systems inside the portfolio of the air defenders to solve this in isolation. So you'll see a, an example, the hypervelocity gun weapon system. Okay, can we use a 155 with a projectile in an air defense role? Okay, it's already a platform that exists. Uh, work that technology and use that where you have FA ADA uh, integration, and we've seen it done in the past. CRAM was a good example of it. CMIC, okay, bottom right on the chart. Uh, counter UAS mobile integrated capability. We already demonstrated this a year ago uh, at Fort Bliss, and we're going back again now for the NIE in uh, the spring and doing it again. This is a complete field artillery structure used in an ADA counter UAS role, okay? 13 series using a Q-50 radar, finding UASs, using LDRs to identify them, and then engaging with non-lethal tools or a couple of uh, kinetic tools uh, that we're looking at. All 13 series doing an air defense mission, not stuck in the 14 series, the air defenders but uh, using things in a different way, okay? Platforms that already exist. 111, we heard about one sensor, one shooter, and one C4I system, okay? That's the long-term goal, working it internal to the branches and then ultimately cross-branch. Uh, ultimately, you might get to the point where there's a radar guy or a radar gal, okay? You work a Q53 uh, or you work a Patriot radar or, or an air defense radar that's on the network. And so that has, that's the kind of change in the schoolhouse uh, and the branches that we look for. A lot of times we talk material, but you have to think through that as well. Who's going to man it? How are you going to train them on it uh, and keep it modernized? Um, organizational change. We have Army Air Missile Defense Commands right now. Do they need to become theater fires commands on behalf of the ASCCs and the, uh, and the COCOMs? Um, second one I'd offer is cross-domain expansion. And what I'd tell you here is why not? Uh, obviously, the Army is focused on the land domain, but so are a lot of other uh, uh, services, okay, to enable the land domain. As air defenders, you've been operating from the ground, but contributing to the air, air domain for years, okay? So there's no reason in the world why we can't take our fires capability and put it out into the sea. Uh, you saw the explosions up on the chart with that and others on some of the videos, exo-atmosphere converging at 30,000 miles an hour, whatever it is, we'll hit a boat and we'll hit a ship. And that will offer what was mentioned before, you want to impose multiple levers, have something come from the land that will affect uh, an adversary's sea capability. Uh, so we know we can do this, okay? So we have to uh, use that as well. And you see JFOs up there. General Mann mentioned using satellite and other technology. How do we enable our forward observers with anything more than a compass and a map uh, to give us what we need uh, on the offensive side? The third thing is leveraging gym capacity. And, and I highlight this. Uh, counter UAS, we have to institutionalize like we did IEDs. Remember 15 years ago when IEDs started up, and we initially started with turn to the engineer community and said, hey, there's these things underground that have caused a lot of problems. Make that problem go away. Dig them up. Make them go away. We soon found out that wasn't going to work, and it was an Army problem, and it was a joint problem. And we worked it as, an or as a community, interagency, joint, stood Jaito up, and attacked it as, an, as a, a holistic approach and made a lot of progress with it. The UAS has to be the next, I institutionalize it across the Army, okay? Where it's not just the air defender's problem to solve for a brigade combat team or to enable freedom of maneuver for a combatant commander. So we gotta institu institutionalize this as well. Combined training is a must. We saw that in, in some of the pictures, live fires, high Mars Patriot, the ADA with UAE, working in, in, uh, with Korea, US Army Europe doing great work, working with the allies as well. 
uh, that has to continue uh, to enable us as we move forward. Multi-compo. We talked about the 100th Missile Brigade, uh, the great work in the NCR we see right now. Uh, I visited an 88 Brigade this week up at a, at a warfighter, National Guard, uh, up at 4ID's warfighter. Absolutely a must, uh, looking at the structure that we have and making the, the entire formation as most capable as possible. So, so from the fire center perspective, this is the emerging approach moving towards the future consistent with the Army operating concept. And so ultimately, I think if you sort of put it in simple terms, we have to improve our current fighting position, continue making better what we have, and at the same time planning the attack uh, to move ourselves into the future and have to balance that. So bring down the slides. With that, that's, uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, John. And, and with that, I'd like to now lead off with a, a joint perspective on this and ask uh, Rich Glitz, uh, Technical Director of JIAMDO, a question to kind of set the stage. Uh, Rich, shortly after the Army released its IAMD strategy in 2012, the Joint Staff released a joint IAMD Vision 2020. The vision recognizes resources are becoming constrained and the threat more capable. Could you comment on the solutions it offers for the dilemma at hand? Absolutely. Thanks, General. And. Uh... Looking through the two visions side by side, there are more similarities in them than just the release date. Uh, they come to a lot of the same conclusions and envision the same end states. But there are differences, too, in that the uh, Army's AMD vision uh, spends some, uh, some ink and paper on ways and means, whereas the chairman's vision is more of an ends document. It, it projects the vision out uh, and lets uh, the, the how to get there up to the, to the individual, the services, the COCOMs. Uh, but it does give us some good clues of what the end state should look like, and uh, the chairman communicates those in the, in the six imperatives that are contained in the IMD vision. If I could, I'd go through the six imperatives and give, uh, in the interest of time, just one example of some great uh, success stories we've had on the way to uh, realizing the end state uh, the chairman has given us. Uh, so the first uh, imperative from... Uh, the chairman's IMD vision is to incorporate, fuse, exploit, and leverage every bit of information available, regardless of source or classification, and distribute it as needed to U.S. forces and selected partners. Uh, we've had a great success story uh, with a teaming between uh, JIAMDO, the Air Force, and certain three-letter agencies to uh, take available nationally uh, collected information strip it of uh, classification sources and uh, push it directly to the warfighter on operationally relevant timelines. Now, the key is the, the timeline. That information has always been available, but it's been in a matter of weeks usually, which is useful to uh, an intelligence analyst in a vault somewhere, but a guy or a gal on an airplane or in a combat uh, on a ship uh, needs a reliable spot on his scope and he doesn't care where that information came from. He just needs to know, is it a threat, and, and am I clear to kill it? So uh, uh, that's uh, one way that we've uh, begun to realize the chairman's vision's first imperative. And that's actually uh, uh, in use in certain places around the world now. It's not just uh, PowerPoint. It's a real thing now. Uh, second uh, imperative in the chairman's IMD vision is to make interdependent joint and combined force employment the baseline. And I think the real key word there is interdependent, not just interoperable where you know, our systems look alike and uh, basically have the same operator's manual, but uh, we get together with the other uh, services or nations that employ these systems and uh, agree on uh, concepts of operation, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, a real... Uh, Accomplishment has been the establishment of uh, IMD centers of excellence in the three COCOMs of PACOM, UCOM, and CENTCOM. Uh, they're, they're bringing uh, all the different operators in the area together. They can compare their concepts, their TTPs, and uh, begin to uh, share some of the responsibility for defense of their, their areas and uh, build some trust. Uh, the third imperative is ta to target development, modernization, fielding, and science and technology efforts to meet specific gaps in IMD capabilities, all the while stressing affordability and interoperability. Now, one example that just hit the streets recently is the uh, Future of the Army Commission's report that highlighted shortfalls in shore-ed and recommended growing the shore-ed force. Um, probably very appropriate in light of the threats you mentioned, uh, with the UAS, uh, 
more attention has been given to cruise missiles lately. Uh, increasing shore can allow a Patriot to concentrate more on the ballistic missile mission and uh, use the, the shorehead for those uh, growing threats that are harder to detect until they get a little closer in, like uh, the UAS cruise missiles, like I said. The, the fourth imperative is to focus passive defensive efforts on addressing potential capability and capacity shortfalls in air and missile defense. Uh, a lot of the efforts are classified there, but I can tell you one thing we're doing is uh, incorporating passive defense and dispersion, dispersal into our studies. Previous, uh, uh, maybe you've heard of the Joint Capability Mix study, the measure of success there was leakers. So, okay, we, we, several leakers got through, but we didn't roll into the study what the effect of those were, and everything continued to operate at 100%. So now we have a the follow-on study of the Joint Regional IMD Capabilities Mix study that's ongoing now, and that does play uh, air-based survivability and the effect of those leakers. So it's a little bit more holistic and will give us uh, uh, a basis to plan for the future of uh, passive defense. Number five, establish and pursue policies to leverage partner contributions. Well, this can be as simple as basing rights. Look at the uh, European phased adaptive approach. Uh, we have Aegis Ashore based in Poland and the Czech Republic with some minor amount of uh, assistance from the host nations. They're basically U.S. assets that depend on basing rights. The same thing could be said for the uh, the four uh, destroyers we're basing in uh, Rota, Spain, as part of the European phased adaptive approach. Just one example of the ways we're leveraging partner contributions. Another great example is... Uh, the Maritime Theater Missile Defense uh, at Sea demo that happened off the uh, east coast of Scotland not too long ago. It was a great uh, uh, demonstration of uh, international uh, missile defense at sea. And the final uh, sixth imperative of the Chairman's vision is to create an awareness of the IMD mission and benefits of proper utilization across the DOD. It goes on a little bit, but I think that's what we're doing right here. Forums like this are, are the great, a great way to, uh, to spread the word and awareness about where we are, where we need to go, where we need to be. I've seen recently an incredible growth in the number of panels, uh, interviews, speeches, uh, papers published, and uh, we're continuing to do so inside the department as well. Giamdo products are include a, a C2 of uh, IMD ConOps that's uh, in the works. Uh, we're publishing a Joint Pub 3-01 Air and Missile Defense uh, in coordination with our, our partners. So we're well on the way to realizing the Chairman's vision. These are just uh, one example for each imperative. The success so far is uh, really based on stating a clear vision without constraining people with specific ways to get there, and uh, they will follow. Now, there's still a lot of left work to do, a lot of work left to do. One example there is to create a system architecture for IMD. Jamdo developed an operational architecture so we know how to play together, who the part players are, what information needs to be passed, but we need a systems architecture that shows us how to work together, how the systems will inter interoperate, and so we can build them to play and work together in the future as a baseline and not as a, a band-aid fix-it uh, approach. So probably taking more time than you had in mind, but I'll uh, conclude there. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Now, Dr. Markowitz, from the uh, Headquarters Department of the Army perspective, in 2004, the Army transformed into a modular force, and the Air Defense Force shed much of its short-range capability. But we preserved and grew the Patriot Force. Now we see the short and mid-range threat reemerging, no reduction in ballistic missile threat. So what is the Army's vision to bringing balance back to the force? Um, no, no, thank you very much, and well, certainly thank you, AUSA. So in about 75-part answer, I'll try to reinforce General Rossi's <laughs> initial piece. Now I'll try to kind of keep it quick, but I, got, I do have to probably take a step back, take a look at total Army to provide a bit of vision. I also remember the Army staff, so I kind of have to kind of give the, the, the overall Army pitch. You know, we are downsizing to a 980K force, and uh, as we all said, General Rossi's threat picture really kind of highlights the challenges we are facing, but we are downsizing. You know, from the um, from the Budget Control Act and the way we're trying to do it, we are getting smaller. Um, but we're just as busy. You, everyone here understands fully the Air Defense Force and how that is one of the most demanded forces. 187,000 soldiers are supporting combatant commanders today. Uh, seven different named operations in 140 different locations. We're just busy across the board. Um, we source about 64% of all DOD emergent demand, so the Army is still kind of the service of choice. 
Uh, never mind the Air Defense Community being a service of choice amongst combatant commanders. Um, the National Commission for the Future of the Army, kind of a contentious report uh, just released. Some of its major conclusions are that the national strategy needs to be relooked. The trying to set the 980K force is really a floor, and we need to be thinking about possibly, if you want to control these different, handle these different missions, getting a little bit bigger to resource all those fine things that General Rossi had uh, at the end. But unfortunately, we, we live in that uncertain environment, so we have to do a lot of things internally, or look at have to do all these things internally, to do many of the things General Rossi had just talked about. I think at the heart of it, it is becoming more flexible and tailorable. Uh, I want to kind of give just quickly kind of three highlights, three name drops. Um, you know, a great capability, just kind of the innovation General Rossi had talked about earlier, I say is the Dismount Patriot Information Coordination uh, Central or Center Cell. Um, right now in uh, our center, we've got four battalions worth of C2 commanding 2.75 battalions worth of firing capability. With this new system getting more tailored C2, we'll go to more two battalions worth of C2 commanding 2.75 fires. So that's a move in the right direction of how to create a more tailored, customizable force given the limited resources we have. You know, great innovation amongst the air defense community to, to kind of get beyond the traditional Patriot system. In the last panel, uh, uh, General Sheriff and Colonel Spillane kind of highlighted the importance of uh, AIAMD, or my favorite, uh, IBCF, Integrated Battle Control System, an incredible, huge capability to make the force more modular, to tailor it to exactly what's needed. As General Ross is kind of creating a vision, a way to synthesize not only what's coming from the air defense community, but what's coming from the fires community, the joint community, kind of creating better overall situational awareness. It not only provides better efficiency of the force, there's more capability, more survivability. It's an incredible plus. Third one I want to kind of talk about more directly to your question on getting at the lower tier threats is the indirect fire protection capability that's in development right now. That is trying to get CRAM to that next stage. It's also providing a lot of versatility other than just guns, providing either customized capability, be it cruise missile, next increment to counter rocket mortar. Again, customization at a very low tactical level. Since we only have 900K forces and even a much smaller air defense community, how do we make every soldier count so they can deal as, as much threat as possible? I also want to kind of highlight the challenge that General Rossi said, and it very much affects this community, I think, more than all, is how to take on the EW challenge. It is much more than the solution is far beyond the air missile defense community. It is an entire Army community. So as we had representatives from our cyber and the network community before, we really need to integrate across the Army to provide that type of robust response to EW, both defensively but also offensively. Um, there's many things happening throughout the Army. The, from the counter UAS, uh, General Rossi, I remember your previous the last chief, you know, everything from camouflage nets for counter UAS, thinking about just those old basics and getting that back to training, things we need to do to think holistically about how to counter the threat. And there's strange opportunities that start to pop up when we start to get 30 millimeter striker with airburst munitions. That might have some air defense capability coming from the maneuver force. We just need to think through all the implications to bring all soldiers to bear to be able to answer this wide range. Uh, so indirect, okay, not 75 parts, maybe 50, on uh, trying to reinforce General Rossi's initial comments about some of that, how to approach it in a very wide manner. Thank you, sir. Now turning to General Buckley from uh, Northern Command. You now, NORTHCOM is probably the only COCOM who has to work the high side and the low side of the threat set. Uh, that's one that includes ICBMs potentially out of North Korea. You know, errant postmen and drug runners and gyrocopters, and a few lost weekend aviators in between. Uh, and as a guy who sat in an assessor's seat, uh, I know there were lieutenants who would love to stood behind me and watch me perspire as we tried to figure out what was going on. Uh, as we see our adver adversaries demonstrating long-range strike with cruise missiles and others employing UASs, where do you believe our priori priority of effort should be? Well, uh, first of all, thank you to AUSA for the invitation to be here. <clears throat> been very much a learning experience for me and being new to NORTHCOM, relatively new, uh, it is the, the broad mission set is really unbelievable. The, the three mission areas, obviously Homeland Defense, but the defense to support the civil authorities all the way from Zika virus to unaccompanied children uh, to the, the theater security cooperation efforts that go on with Mexico and the Bahamas. Um, but I think Homeland Defense really is 
obviously where the most dangerous um, scenarios exist and in my portfolio and then uh, with Admiral Gortney wearing his Northcom hat uh, the North Green certainly is is a big concern uh, obviously the launch on Saturday raised some eyebrows again um, as General Mann mentioned that it, the payload was larger than than we've ever seen from them uh, and although we don't know it was fully successful mission it's certainly more successful than they've done in the past so uh, that's obviously high priority for uh, Admiral Gortney as we work forward uh, with our ground based mid course uh, defense system. How are we going to ensure that we are capable against that growing threat from uh, North Korea or even potentially Iran? Um, so, really, uh, what he's pushing for is the improvement in sensors and the ability to have better discrimination. Uh, I think that all plays into our ability to impact our shot doctor because we do have a limited. A defense capability. We know it's only going to be 44 ground-based interceptors, so we need to be able to preserve those, those in a manner that we uh, know that we're going to be effective when we need those uh, ground-based interceptors. So uh, a lot of effort going in uh, in those areas. Uh, another high priority area for Admiral Gordon is, is thinking about the cruise missile threat, and, and that, again, has only been heightened by uh, the demonstrated uh, efforts of the Russians in Syria and Iraq. Uh, the standoff distances that they've demonstrated recently, uh, and so it really goes to Admiral Gortney's uh, NORAD hat. How are we going to ensure that we can protect the homeland against those threats? And again, it goes back to better sensors, uh, better discrimination, um, and some of those, again, being space-based, although very uh, expensive. That's probably the technology that we're going to need at some point down the road. So uh, I think those are certainly high on the priority list uh, for Admiral Gortney uh, as we move forward. And it's going to be a difficult role, but uh, by working with his fellow COCOMs, with the services, but really, uh, even more importantly, down the road, working with industry in order to take those technologies as they come to a point where we can really weaponize them and, and use them uh, to get them to the warfighter as soon as possible is, is high on his priority list. Thank you, Ron. General Bramhall, as a tactical commander with forces pulling duty today in the homeland, where do you believe our priority effort should be to enable defeat? It, it sounds like a loaded question, but uh, of course, you know the, the the requirement that we have is is the defense of the homeland, and uh, to us, that's one of our the, our main uh, uh, mission sets. And, and how we conduct this mission set of the course, you know, is, is we're in, we're heavily involved in in the defense of the NCR. And the defense of the NCR involves a number of sensors. It's, it's also it's, it's a gen operation, too, uh, because we rely heavily on the FAA feeds. Uh, as you know, that you can park certain places in D.C. and get five tickets from five different jurisdictions. <laughs> and so that's one of, the, it's one of the things that we have to work with is, is how do we work within this, this greater interagency? Uh, General Etter, the first Air Force commander, has, has a very good chart that really... Um, looks at how we, how we do our missions and how we have additional requirements. But right now, our systems cannot handle the requirements itself or the capabilities. And if you look at it, if you can envision a, a, a bell curve, and at the top of the bell curve, you have the um, O&E, or Operational Wiggle Sets. You know, the NCR was, was the defense of the NCR was, was built around one threat and that was the aviation threat. So now if you look at the ends of the bell curve, you get to the sophisticated, such as your cruise missile, and then your unsophisticated, which was proven to be able to penetrate one of the most heavily defended airspaces by a guy delivering mail in a gyrocopter. <laughs> but what this did for us, it, it actually showed us where our gaps are. And the fact that, yeah, we're great at, at one set, I'm great at taking down a Delta VL319 Airbus if I have to. But the fact is that I don't have the capability, uh, either the defeat capability, I have the detect capability in certain places, but I don't have the ability to defeat the other ends of the threat. And if you look at the, the number of, um, of, of UASs that we have today, you can buy this stuff off the shelf. You know, what is my requirement? What is Northcom's requirement? You know, what is, the, what is the interagency requirement? But once you move to the other end of the spectrum, you get into the cruise missile, that, that is our requirement. And we must develop the capabilities to defeat uh, this, this threat. And right now, working through the fire center, 
the development of, of a, the MML, which I hope to integrate into my architecture right now at the NCR, it gives us a much better ability to defeat. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we're looking at uh, uh, putting up the uh, second error stat that uh, somehow got away from us for Jalen's. Because what Jalen's does for me, it gives me the ability to look out over the horizon. It gives the commanders more time to assess the risk, assess the threat, and also give my people more time to engage. And that's what I need. I need the ability to look out further if it's Jalen's or something else. But in so doing so, I need the ability to defeat much further out. And that's why I'm uh, heavily relying on General Rossi at the fire center to give me the capability so I can protect the homeland. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Colonel Lyons is the deputy commanding officer of the 94th AAMDC and a tactical commander with forces forward and on site duty today in the Pacific. Where do you believe our priority of effort should be? Sir, thanks on behalf of uh, General Sanchez, the commanding general for 94th Army Air Missile Defense Command. It's a privilege and honor to, to be here, uh, to invited to participate in the panel. Thanks to AUSA for putting on this event. Um, so as we look at our, our threat um, in the Pacific, um, just to put it, our, our priorities in, in context, um, it, it's an extremely complex threat. We're challenged um, both with ca on a capacity side, both on the peninsula and potential um, pacing adversaries like the PRC where have robust uh, um, ballistic missile uh, defense capability. Um, we know that our potential adversaries are pursuing um, advanced countermeasures. Uh, they're WMD capable. Um, and, um, and, and it's a practice capability. The other thing um, that, P that the PRC um, is, is working towards, um, they obviously uh, employ a very robust um, aerial portion of the threat. So it's not just the ballistic missile threat that we're concerned about, it's the cruise missile, um, it's, it's fourth and fifth gen fighters uh, that, that complicate it and their ability to, to use those in a complex uh, integrated manner. So, so given that, um, our, our priorities, it, it's not surprising our priorities kind of um, mirror a lot of the, the Army's priorities put forth, uh, both in the AMD strategy of 2012 as well as uh, Waypoint One. Um, but our, our number one priority is, is, uh, is mission command. It's improving and enhancing our mission command. And that's just not on the, on the material side. So for us, there's, there's three parallel efforts that, that um, we work in terms of uh, mission command, capability, capacity, and, and processes. So first off, in terms of capability, uh, the previous panel just talked about all the, the tremendous benefits of, of IBCS. Um, <coughs> given with the backdrop of, of rebalance to the Pacific and, and thanks to um, um, the Army PEO missiles in space as well as the Fire Center of Excellence, um, our, our battalion on, on Okinawa 1180A is prioritized um, first in the shoot to, to field IBCS. And that's going to be a, a tremendous uh, capability and enhancement for us, because given our theater's um, vastness, the distances, and the fact that a lot of it's comprised of little island chains, which are, are very important uh, to control, um, it's going to it's going to break us away from the paradigm of of, of being limited uh, to uh, a battalion ICC. So that that's huge for us, uh, and it gives us flexibility um, in defense designs and, and a redundancy in in, in the network. Uh, to counter some of the, the, the electronic warfare aspects that, that we also look at in, in the theater. Um, additionally, uh, IBCS going to 1-1 to is also going to set the foundation because it's a precursor, it's a prerequisite uh, for integrating uh, IFPIC 2i uh, in, into, that, um, into that capability set. Uh, IFPIC 2i is going to bring forward um, a, a cruise missile and counter UAS capability that, that's much needed. Uh, and the ability to leverage uh, IBCS as a common mission command uh, is, is going to be extremely beneficial to us. And we're also excited, Dr. Markowitz talked about the dismounted ICC uh, that we'll be receiving in a couple years. Uh, in terms of capacity, I'm really talking about how we organize for combat, how we do mission command um, in, the, in the Pacific. Um, one of the things that uh, we've, we've worked hard, and, and, and thanks to the Army through the total Army analysis process, we were able to achieve uh, was an additional 88 brigade headquarters for the, for the Pacific. So we have one brigade headquarters, the 35th, which, which really, they have the, the fight on Penn. Uh, the rest of the theater, um, you know, we typically rely on, on, on follow-on forces. But in terms of uh, phase zero setting, uh, setting conditions, 
um, the, the need for a brigade headquarters um, definitely exists. And so we're looking forward to uh, receiving that in, um, in FY19. And it's going to allow the brigade to focus on the tactical piece of the off pen theater fight and allow the, the double AMDC to get more into the operational and, and strategic level. The other thing that we've done from an organizational, from a capacity mission command perspective is um, we've, we've put forward mission command elements in, in, uh, in Japan and Korea um, and, and in Okinawa. And they work day to day within the AO, their respective AOCs. They work with our partner nations, which are on the same basis uh, with them at Osan and, and, and Yakota. Uh, and they work for um, the Armistice um, um, ADSE. Um, the last big effort we, we we uh, have been putting a lot of time and effort into, in terms of mission command, is, is processes. And by that, I mean the, uh, the combined and joint theater, air, missile defense uh, work group and board process. Um, arguably, one of the most significant um, roles of a double AMDC commander is that of being a deputy area air defense commander for the theater's um, area air defense commander, or, or ADC. And so, you know, in order to get after um, and prioritize to be able to defeat the full range of threat, it's not just the Army. This requires a, a joint and combined solution set, as many others have, have said. So the JTAM, CJTAM process is that it's a dad owned process that synchronizes, integrates um, the, the, both the combined on the partner side as well as uh, on the joint side um, capabilities to employ uh, in, a, in an operational environment. Some of the things we've been able to do is standardize the procedures. Uh, we use this both in, in not only in exercises, uh, but in real world. We used it to, to set the theater for the recent TD2 launch, um, and, and with that venue, provided inputs and, and posture recommendations up through um, General Robinson as the PACAF commander and her ADC hat up to uh, the PACOM commander. Uh, and some of the some of the key highlights, the results we've achieved is approved bilateral CONOPS for, for real-world provocation cycles, improved defense designs, uh, and, and, and updated um, area air defense plans. Three, three other quick uh, priorities. Uh, we, we do a lot with um, theater security cooperation and building partner capacity. I know Joe McNamara is leading a panel on that next. I'll, I'll just say that um, Without going into it, it's a critical element of, of, our, of our strategy, and, and we do a lot with our, our, our partners um, uh, because, again, there's no scenario in the Pacific where the U.S. is, is going uh, alone. Our third priority would be uh, improving our existing capabilities um, over time within the, the AOR. Uh, we're fortunate to be on the front end of Config 3 Plus fielding. Um, again, thanks to the, to, the, to the community. Our partners, uh, such as Republic of Korea, Taiwan, are also in in the midst of modernizing uh, their own Patriot forces. So that's a, uh, a win for the, from a theater perspective. And we continue to advocate for uh, ifpic 2 i which is going to greatly um, assist in countering the complex integrated um, attacks we expect with both ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, uh, and, and aerial threats. The, the last part of the improving capabilities is, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's the training and certification aspect, which we also work hard, it's that human in the loop, but, but that's an important process, making the best use of our RT3s. Uh, and the last thing I'll just mention is we, uh, in conjunction with USERPAC, we, we advocate for uh, those innovative technologies, the, the power gun, as, as General Rashi mentioned at the beginning. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Rob. And finally, uh, Mr. Barry Pike is the Program Executive Officer for Missiles in Space. Now, you have programs underway. We have emerging gaps. Where's the uh, research and development community trying to focus its effort now? Thanks, sir. Uh, and thanks to General Mann and for AUSA for uh, hosting our panel here today to, uh, to get our message out. So I'll be very brief with my comments. Uh, folks have already discussed quite a bit about our programs as a material developer, our programs and systems that we manage. So really what I want to do is just tie together a couple of strategic thoughts. And so what are we doing on the RDT and E side to really get after the challenges and gaps that we have? And so really I'd refer you to uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army's uh, 2012 Air and Missile Defense Modernization Plan. That is what we're doing. That is what we're doing in our acquisition programs to get after the gaps and challenges that we have. General Mann just mentioned that we've updated that over the course of the last few months into a Waypoint One vector check 
on how we're doing against our 2012 plan. And so by and large, and General Mann referred to this, we're on track with many of the initiatives. And so to draw back just one other point, and I'll really leave it at this and leave some time for some questions, is tying it back to Don Tyson's briefing. To enable us to really execute this holistic, challenging air and missile defense modernization across the services, across agencies with our partners at MDA, across our joint and coalition partners from a U.S. perspective and from a U.S. Army perspective, the thing that's really the critical enabler is the consistent, stable, predictable funding to keep these programs and these modernization efforts really moving ahead at the pace. You, you hear the panels talking about how interconnected all these efforts are. And so when one of those efforts gets desynchronized, we go back into a major replan mode. And so that takes a lot of time and energy uh, across not just the Army, not just across the PEO, but with the fire centers, we're impacting the double AMDCs in terms of delivering capabilities. <coughs> Uh, our relationships and our interfaces that we maintain with the Missile Defense Agency, with our test community partners out at the test ranges, all of those things get disrupted. Um, and so at the end of the day, what we really need, what we're executing to is the previous guidance and the Army's well thought out holistic plan to modernize the Air and Missile Defense Force. We're making great progress against that. Really, I'll just leave it for there for your questions uh, in particular. I do have lots of specifics about the accomplishments that we've made over the past few months. Some of them have been uh, referred to here today. But instead of getting into all the programmatics and what we're doing out on test ranges and how we're bringing these programs to fruition, I'll just leave that for, uh, for the following questions. Thank you, sir. Well, here, here's the first question. Uh, in 2015, the Army conducted an analysis of alternatives for a new uh, air and missile defense sensor. Um, originally, it was believed that that would be completed, it would be released about this time, and it would feed the way or set the stage for some sort of competition in 2017 amongst potential candidates. Is that still the case, or is that changed as a strategy as a way forward? Okay. You may. Could be wrong. I think the, there's a lot of congressional interest on the AOA. I believe we've shared some of the results to to the members. Um, uh, that is still our plan. It's it's still to go forward. I can't probably you know funding only changes a year to year. So is it 17 or 18 to part the slips? I I guess we'll just get to release the budget. We'll look in the details to see if everything is exactly right on per fiscal year. But is broadly the strategy is competition on the radar. The analysis of alternatives we felt was sufficient, and we want to drive on for a new system. Thank you. All right, second question. We, we discussed the 155-millimeter uh, hypervelocity uh, capability uh, as, a, as an air and missile defense asset or weapon. So how close are we to the, is that concept or that to reality versus a popular science futuristic capability? Well, sir, I can tell you just from a technology perspective, um, before Ms. Shu left, she had us tracking several S&T efforts, the high-energy laser efforts that SMDC is working on, uh, the railgun efforts that the Navy's been working on, uh, guided projectiles, uh, and, and we do that jointly. Of course, we're not the only PEO, as we've talked about it today. This is not just an air defense or a PEO missiles in space unique endeavor, so PEO ammunition. Uh, our sister PEO, um, Jim Shields, that runs that, is heavily engaged in, of course, all of the cannon-fired munitions. And so we work jointly uh, across those interfaces as well. And so there's a lot of high interest uh, in, in being able to do those guided projectiles. Actually, um, our new deputy PEO, General Cole, came out of PEO ammunition where he was the Excalibur PM. He's very well versed. Uh, General Knutson had some time in that portfolio as well. And uh, so the ties are strong there. One of the things I'll just offer up as well as a comment, one of the things that really pulls us together as a community across these seams is really General Mann's leadership. Um, 
So every two weeks across this community and more, uh, he gets all of us together for a telecon. That's across the FCOE, all the AAMDCs, across GAG3, the PEOs, uh, all the folks that are engaged in this endeavor. And so, um, so, so to you, sir, uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, for bringing us all together into a holistic plan. I know uh, I saw uh, Colonel Daly uh, in the back there between his leadership and doing the initial iteration of our 2012 plan in the Damo AM AMD arena and General Four Micah, who was uh, also down that path, and then you picked up the ball. So, so all of those S&T efforts, um, we continue to make progress in. Uh, like Dr. Markowitz was talking about, there are so many variables in terms of funding stability or instability over the course of time it takes to bring um, new technologies to the forefront and get them out to the field, um, you know, is one of those things that's hard to put specific time frames on for something that's in the S&T domain today. But we know we are making great progress and it offers a lot of great potential, um, like somebody was mentioning, of changing the cost curve. It may have been General Rossi about getting on the side of the, the right side of the cost equation uh, for bringing these cheaper systems to bear. If I could just add one piece. Uh, this is a high uh, Secretary of Defense, DepSec Def interest item. Uh, in some ways, it's becoming a view of can, the, can we really field ground-baking disruptive technology fast? And we, I think everyone recognizes this is high risk. The technology has jumped between, you know, internally from rail guns to powder guns, and we're still kind of sifting through. But the idea is move fast. Use those types of techniques we had done. We kind of plowed through in the war of getting rapid capability out there. Can we provide those techniques to get more game-changing, newer technologies out fast? This is one of those areas in the spotlight. We want, the, we, everyone at General Ross, we kind of, we need this type of capability. It will be exactly as we think we envision right now with that type of piece. We realize it's a high risk, but we're willing to be flexible in how to deliver this capability quickly. I'll throw in a, a brief uh, one or two liner here also. That's the hypervelocity gun systems are being worked by the Strategic Capabilities Office. They don't work low priority uh, projects like Dr. Markowitz said. This is definitely a high interest item for the department. And we're already working uh, in Jamdo on how to fit in the gun-based systems into the traditional air defense systems, how they'll interoperate and work together to form a, um, a close-in defense. Okay. A final question. As we think about repurposing vehicles or capability resident in the BCTs today, are we honestly working that hard to bring back, I'll call it safe ads, as a capability without having to grow a true shore ad force? I'll take a first cut at that, and I would tell you the answer is uh, is yes. And as I mentioned earlier, and uh, is it's not just the air defenders looking at the, that threat set. If it's a counter recon fight, the maneuver folks are very interested in it. And so what we're, what we're not going to do is bring back a shorehead battalion and lay that on top of a BCT. What we're focused on is bringing an air defense capability to the BCT, which they have a great interest in, without the burden of lugging a battalion behind it uh, if we're trying to stay expeditionary. So repurposing equipment, what, you know, as we talk about potential DE and other capabilities that come out there, how could you add that to the maneuver formation without slowing them down uh, to, to make them lethal, not just on the land, but up into the air as well? Uh, and that's being worked. And I really believe that the, the driver behind this is the Army operating content and our the challenges that we're working, because we're working them as a community across the the COEs and not just stovepiping them and saying, Air Defender, you solve anything that's up there, tanker, you solve tank problems, et cetera. We're trying to work as a community. So I see, I'm highly optimistic. I'd like to get a yeah, cut of this one too, is, and this gets back to what General Sheriff said is about getting back to the human dimension. You know, I think we've lost a, a pretty much a whole generation of, of knowledge base of, of how we work with the maneuver force. And so one of the things we need to do is, is we need to get back into the, get back into the dirt get back into the maneuver forces and trained their commanders on how do, how do we integrate air defense? What does air defense offer them? You know, in the conflicts we've had in Afghanistan, Iraq, it wasn't needed. But now it is needed today. You know, with the war fighters uh, getting back to the NTCs. So the actual commander can actually see air defenders on the ground and understand the, the capability these people bring to them. And it's not just to destroy 
what's, what's ever in the air, but it's also to work out the deconfliction of, of fires too. And that's one thing that air defenders do very well, working with the aviators and working with the maneuver. And again, it gets back to the fire center of, of retraining people, getting back to the maneuver center and retraining people. It gets back to the human dimension. And it gets back to what General Sullivan says, it's about soldiers and how do we properly train soldiers. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's give a big round of applause. Thanks very much uh, to all of you for that. Uh, we've got a pretty good afternoon uh, planned for you, building partner capacity, maintaining forward presence, and uh, 